Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. I can't believe it's the monkey pox season already. I haven't even taken down my climate change decorations. And I'd only got over the COVID, not to mention the Ukraine mania. Well, it's the mother of all talk shows, and we're going to be discussing many of these issues. And more, because it's an hour and a half tonight, more callers, more guests, and it's the callers that choose the subjects rather than the other way around. And we've got a poll running. Should Prime Minister Boris Johnson be on the ballot paper for, well, the new Prime Minister? After all, he was overthrown in a coup, an anti-democratic coup, actually. And when you see the state of their second order, you wonder why they bothered. Slippery, fishy, rishy, sunak and Mrs. Untrustworthy, who dresses up in a dead woman's clothes, but is not fit to carry her handbag. Thousands of people have besieged the Conservative Party headquarters with the demand that Boris Johnson be on the ballot paper. Do you agree? Yes or no? You can vote on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe and on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway. We'll be talking to the indefatigable voice of the front line, Gonzalo Lira, in the war zone, in the wars, a man who was disappeared and whom we all feared the worst for. He's back, and he's talking to you on the mother of all talk shows. And another man who was disappeared, Chris Williamson, the former member of parliament, Corbyn loyalist, who was in a modern-day Dreyfus affair, deconstructed, destroyed, annihilated. I watched it in real time. And almost nobody lifted a finger to help him, including the people that he'd spent the last decade campaigning with and for. It's all coming up on the mother of all talk shows over the next hour and a half. Who knows, maybe next week or the week after that, we'll be back to the full three hours. But we've got a lot of people on holiday and I myself am still on vacation. Even though the magic of television places me squarely in the heart of the empire in London. But I'm not really. They say the camera never lies, but actually it lies all the time. Take a look, for example, at the white phosphorus attack on the people of Donetsk, the civilian people of Donetsk. Just last night, there are idiots on YouTube that think it was the Russians that were firing it on their own people. Anyway, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride because this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Lean in for the nugget. Neither President Biden nor President Zelensky will survive this war. Now that President Biden has got COVID, he told us last week he had cancer, which came as something of a surprise, to the members of his cabinet and the people who in overwhelming numbers were told voted him in as the president of the United States. Whether or not he just got the C words mixed up, he meant to say he had COVID and said he had cancer, who can tell? Least of all, Joe Biden. But we know he's got COVID. The question is, will he survive it? I have my doubts if I was Mrs. Biden I'd carefully check what the doctors were bringing in in their bags, what medication they were applying. Because when your public opinion poll ratings fall to the lowest ever suffered 
by any president of the United States, including Richard Nixon, at the height of Watergate, you have got political problems. And when your vice president is as unpopular as Richard Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, who ended up in prison after all, then you've got double political problems. But Joe Biden is sinking in the polls so fast. I'll be surprised if they don't use COVID as the excuse to shuffle him off the stage before he falls off it, before wandering around like a ghost in the White House looking for the lavatory. He accidentally stumbles over the nuclear football and triggers World War III. Not that he's not trying to trigger World War III entirely on purpose. And that brings me to President Zelensky. He won't survive the war either. In fact, I want to be the first to say that President Zelensky did not commit suicide. If he suicided, it came as a great surprise, especially to him. The United States have said that he should step up his personal security. You would have thought that that was already well taken care of and not capable of being stepped up. After all, he is the president in the middle of a raging war. So how much more security can he afford himself of? You would have thought that the United States of America, which has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in his presidency, would at least ensure that his personal security was taken care of. But it was the United States itself who said that his security was now in greater danger and that he should step up his personal security. I think they mean that there are elements at large inside his regime which has been politically cleansed in the last 10 days. He has sacked at least a quarter of his cabinet and many of his top officials in the legal, political and military field. And maybe the US has a hint that there is a coup in preparation against him. That wouldn't be a surprise. After all, he came to power as a result of a coup. Coups are Ukraine. Ukraine is coups. Coups are them. And in the most corrupt country in the entire continent of Europe, and there's quite a bit of competition for that title, who knows if money has changed hands in order to get the political leadership to change hands, if you get my drift. Whatever happens to Zelensky, Russia will get the blame for it, even though if Russia had wanted to kill him, he would have been fertilizer in the first 48 hours of the war. But they have no wish to remove him. Indeed, they have explicitly stated that until the last couple of days, because it has become increasingly clear that with the current regime in Kiev, there will be no end to this war. And in fact, as was said by Mr. Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, just in the last 48 hours, Ukraine as a state runs the risk of disappearing from the map. And that would be a very great pity. It's not what I myself want. I don't think it's what the Russian leadership wants. It's certainly not what I want. It's not what I think needed to happen. Indeed, I have opposed the war in Ukraine since the day that it started with the overthrow of the elected government in Kiev in 2014. I've opposed every single death in the war in Ukraine since 2014. The problem is a lot of people in the world, including a lot of useful idiots, have no idea that the war started in 2014. They think that it started on the 24th of February of 2022. And it's that little knowledge which is dangerous. Because, of course, if you don't know that the war had been raging for eight long years before the Russians entered the country, then you have no idea of what the reasons for this war are, and therefore no idea how we're going to be able to bring it to an end. 
One thing is certain. By pouring more and more money, war materiel, political and diplomatic support into the failed state of Ukraine, you're not going to bring about peace, you are merely going to prolong the agony. And the agony is largely being suffered, first by the people of Ukraine, but second by the people of Europe, third by the people of North America, fourth by the people of Australia and New Zealand. And that's about it, because nobody else has joined the economic war against Russia. To the absolute consternation of the propagandists in the West, Sergei Lavrov, the wisest foreign minister on the planet, I say that without any hint of equivocation, was in Cairo this week, meeting the leaders of much of the world who were warmly lining up to shake his hand. You probably didn't see it in Western mainstream media because it slayed the lie that Russia is isolated. All the African leaders, all the Arab leaders were lining up to shake the hand of the Russian foreign minister. Warmly. He was on the phone to MBS, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, just 24 hours ago. President Putin, that is for a 60-minute conversation that was described by the diplomats as extremely cordial. Russia is not isolated, it's us that are isolated. Russia is not suffering, as the Prime Minister of Hungary just said today, from the economic war we have launched against it. It's us that are suffering. It's a suicide kamikaze mission that by deepening and deepening we're ensuring greater and greater carnage for ourselves. Four governments have now fallen in Europe. Four of the governments that began the war against Russia have now fallen and more of them are likely to fall. It is a truism that Germany is facing a bitter, long, cold winter with mass unemployment and with the presence in its country of millions upon millions of refugees and at the same time a far-right AFD, neo-Nazi party in parliament, in local government, in numbers. What could possibly go wrong? at a time when Germany is now spending more money on defense than it has since Hitler was toppled by the Red Army in 1945. What could possibly go wrong in this picture? A collapsing German economy, a revanchist rising right, millions of scapegoats readily available. What could possibly go wrong? And of course, it's not just in Germany, all over Europe, the farmers of all people have risen up in a general agricultural uprising, started in the Netherlands, spread to Germany, Poland, Italy, and now France. I don't know about British farmers, probably too few of them and too, I don't know, phlegmatic and stoic. But if they ever did get up off their tractor seats, we would be in big trouble too because nobody needs politicians, nobody needs journalists and broadcasters, everybody needs farmers. And yet we in the West have been following an anti-farming agenda as we worship the gods of greenery and a 15-year-old girl, Greta Thornburg, that's who's making our energy policies. That's who's making our agricultural policies. Kill the cows, they're farting too much. Stop eating meat, because you need cows that fart. You get my picture here. We are being led by the nose, like sheep to the slaughter, by people 
who either don't know, don't understand, or don't care what the consequences for us, the ordinary people of even the Western countries. You see, we're supposed to be the free countries. We're supposed to be the free societies, the democracies, but increasingly that's not true. You can vote, of course, to change the government, but you can't vote to change the policies. The policies are within the narrow parameters of the prevailing orthodoxy of neoliberal economics at home and imperialist foreign policies abroad with a big, big dose of wokery and greenery thrown in, garnishing the unpalatable plate that we have been served up and there's nothing else on the menu. If you dare to have even a scintilla of difference about your political approach, like, say, Jeremy Corbyn, you will be systematically destroyed if it's not too unpalatable an illusion, you'll be sliced like salami. First they'll come for him, then they'll come for her, then him, then her, then him, then her, and then eventually you. And because you were struck dumb, staged stum, when they were slicing everybody else, when they come for you, there's nobody left to protest. Pastor Naimola perfectly expressed it. At the depth of the German Holocaust, first they came for the Jews, and I was not a Jew, so I did not protest. Then they came for the communists. Then they came for the trade unionists. Then they came for the social democrats. I was not any of those, so I did not protest, and then they came for me and there was nobody left to protest. That's what Jeremy Corbyn did. And he did it to one of my guests this evening, Chris Williamson, the erstwhile member of parliament for Derby North. And we'll be talking to him about his new book, Ten Years of Hard Labor. I wish I'd only done 10 years of hard labor, Chris. I'd done 36 years of hard labor. And Jeremy Corbyn was outside the hall protesting when I was expelled. Unfortunately, when he became the leader, he pretended I no longer existed. So that's the fair that's on the table for you tonight in the mother of all talk shows. If you are in the United Kingdom or Ireland, you can ring me free of charge on 0808196522. That's 0808196522. It's entirely free, as indeed it is if you're calling from the United States and Canada. It will cost you nothing. It's plus one, 844-944-3344. That's plus one, 844-944-3344. Now here's the poll. Should Prime Minister Boris Johnson be on the Tory leadership ballot? A, yes, B, no. And thousands of people have already voted. And here's the results so far on my Twitter account. Yes, he should be on the ballot, 56%. No, 44%. Quite a high level of no's there on my YouTube channel, and can I make this point in parenthesis? Nearly half of the people watching this show on YouTube have not yet subscribed to my YouTube channel. I'm asking you to do that. It costs you nothing. This show costs you nothing. I'm working for nothing. It's not too much to ask for you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, so please do it before you leave me this evening on the YouTube channel. Only 40% of the people think he should be on the ballot. 60% think not. And on my Telegram channel, 35% only think that Boris Johnson should be on the ballot. 65% think not. After this break, a brave man, Gonzalo Lira, from the front line of the war,
in the Ukraine. Stay tuned. Gosh darn, how do you get this thing to work? Ah, uh, is it that one? Is it, is it this one here? Gosh, was this thing built in America? Jeez. Kamala, would you get in here? I can't get the, uh, gosh darn wireless to work. <laughs> you know I can't answer questions, Joe, when I'm laughing. <laughs> I'm trying to, uh, listen to that Scottish guy on the wireless, the, uh, the, the Galloway fella. Oh, Joe, you're so funny. <laughs> I've been pressing this red button on and off and on and off. Heck, I can't get it to work. Uh, hello, Biden residence. Mr. President, be advised, we have executed the airstrike on Syria, confirmed. <laughs> That's just great. Uh, how long until it gets delivered? I'm starving. Let's take a call. Go ahead, Kenny. Hi, George. Yeah, I just want to talk about the trans issue that you were speaking about earlier. Yeah, I've got go a ahead. book in front of me by uh, Douglas Murray, and he's got a paragraph here. Uh, I'd just like to redo it if that's okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I was standing on the corner <laughs> at a quarter. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll get him off, get him off. He's a nutter. He's a nutter. In the UK, it's 08081. 965-522, and in the U.S., it's plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, who writes that stuff? It's absolutely brilliant, I must say. I've no idea who writes it or voices it, but it's certainly an adornment to the show. I hope you agree. Now, make a note in your diary. On the 12th of October, that's Wednesday, the 12th of October, we're bringing back the midweek mother of all talk shows, which will take the place of the no-budget television Galloway show which currently goes out on a Wednesday night in its stead. We've already brought back the Moats podcast, and many of you are very glad to hear that. But on the 12th of October, the all-singing, all-dancing mother of all talk shows will be back midweek, so two shows every single week. But I need you to fund that, because that has no sponsor and will be dependent on the audience and the way the best way you can do it through our website uh, but the best and fastest way to do it is through the super chat mechanism on YouTube so if you're watching on YouTube please donate for the return of the midweek mother of all talk shows Susie has already donated 20 American dollars Susie God bless you she says good morning from the klepto core the klepto corporatocracy, so-called USA, also a failed state. Love and gratitude to the Galloway Show and Moats. God bless you, Susie. Thank you. And Zook Zookski donates five pounds. Zook Zookski is a regular donor of five pounds, and I'm really grateful. And Zoo says good evening, Gigi and family. And uh, Dino Pantalaukas donates every week $4.99 and says my weekly contribution to the fighting fund solidarity from New York thank you Dino and Quinn Lee donates $4.99 my good friend Teresa Kelly donates 10 US dollars and Ange 2099 
donates two pounds. Thank you very much, Ange. And Rudolf Graspointer donates five euros. The euro's not worth what it once was, but I'm very grateful to you in any case. Now, Gonzalo Lira, in the LA stages of the war in Ukraine, brought us first-hand testimony, literally from the streets of Kharkov, where the bombs and the missiles and the tank fire and the artillery shelling was actually audible in the background to the commentary he was given. He's in a much safer place now, but he's still very close to the action. And above all, he's got his ear to the ground and his eye on what might be the prize. The prize being the end of this carnage on both sides. And he joins me now. Gonzalo, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining us. I hope you can hear me. I can no longer see you on my screen. Uh, but if you can hear me, please uh, take from me the salutation of our entire audience that was very worried about you for quite some considerable time and are delighted to see you alive and well now. Please accept my uh, warmest uh, greetings. And turn, if you will, to the warning that you gave just this week that the Americans themselves are preparing to ditch President Zelensky. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. And I'm a great admirer of you, George, and I will always be very thankful for, for you and all you've done for me. And, and you know what I'm talking about, so thank you. Now, insofar as the current situation in, in uh, Ukraine is concerned, well, um, it, it's, it's, it's so typical of the Americans, unfortunately, of the American uh, foreign policy establishment. They use people, and when their usefulness is over, they throw them away in the most despicable and callous way imaginable. Now, it, it seems very clear that the war in Ukraine is going very, very badly for the Ukrainian armed forces. This is not to question the heroism or bravery of the men or their efforts. On the contrary, the fact that they've lasted so long uh, before the Russian onslaught is a testament to their bravery. But the fact is, and this is something that was obvious from the very beginning of this war, the Russian army is simply bigger, better prepared, better equipped, better led, both militarily and politically, and so they are winning. They are winning decisively. Now, we are coming to the end of the Battle of the Donbass. At this time, the Russian army has chewed through all of the fortifications that the Ukrainian armed forces had developed over the past eight years, and they are about to hit the, the uh, Kramatorsk line, which is the last line of this battle, because it's been a series of lines uh, that protect uh, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces and that have held back the Russians. And the Russians have been relentlessly chewing through these lines and they're getting to the last one. And of course, by this point, the Ukrainian armed forces have been uh, uh, denigrated by the onslaught of the Russian armed forces. And the Russian armed forces are fresh and tidy and, and looking very good and very crisp because they're constantly rotated. Uh, you know, sometimes the, the, uh, the Russians will put in a unit for barely a day of combat and then pull them out and replace them with fresh troops. And so uh, this, of course, means that the Russians always have fresh, rested, well-equipped troops confronting a very weary, very exhausted Ukrainian armed force. And so the, the inevitability is arriving, which is the complete collapse of the Ukrainian armed forces, which I want to insist... It, it, it is not uh, me uh, uh, besmirching in any way or belittling in any way the efforts of the Ukrainian armed forces. It's just the reality on the ground. The Russians are winning. Anybody who says otherwise is just fooling themselves. The HIMARS, which are these uh, multiple, ro uh, multiple rocket launch systems that everybody keeps talking about, this is uh, wonder weapon, you know, pie in the sky thinking. Uh, the, the number of HIMARS being sent to the Ukrainian front are just minimal, trivial. They've sent 20. What the Ukrainians would actually need to be combat effective is maybe 10 times, maybe 15 times that number. I'm talking 200 to 300 high Mars, not 20. And on top of that, of the 20 that they've sent, the Russians have definitively destroyed at least four, and possibly from accounts, an additional two more as of today, 
it doesn't really matter. The truth is that the Russians are winning. And so what's going to happen is that, see, there will come a, a tipping point in this conflict where the Ukrainian armed forces will simply collapse. And when that happens, the Russian armed forces will sweep westward from the Donbass, from the Kherson area. They will sweep westward uh, the Donbass area. They will sweep towards uh, Dnipropetrovsk, which is a center, which is a city rather. In when you're looking at the map of Ukraine, it's dead center. Uh, the Russians will sweep towards that city, and they will probably overrun it. It's the third largest city in in Ukraine. And in Kherson to the south, which is just north of the Crimean Peninsula, they will probably attack Nikolaev and sweep westward towards Transnistria. Uh, they will probably ignore Odessa because Odessa is a historically and for religious reasons a very important city to the Russians. And it's already been clear the Russians have telegraphed their intention of taking Odessa one way or the other. But it is unlikely that they will carry out an assault on the city because they don't want to damage it because of the historical importance that the city has. And so what they'll probably do is simply surround it. They will make a dash for Transnistria, cut off Odessa from the north, from Kiev, and just wait it out because time is on the Russian side. And so what has been increasingly clear is that the West is realizing two things. Number one, they're realizing that NATO cannot match the Russians. The Russians, in terms of their industrial output, in terms of the amount of artillery pieces and munitions, they simply outclass the West. And this has been clear by, uh, this has been pointed out rather, by Western think tanks. The Western think tanks of the um, Royal uh, Unified Society Institute, which is like, a, like the military think tank of Great Britain, there was a very interesting article called The Return of Industrial Warfare, where it was basically pointed out that the West, because of its deindustrialization policies of the last 30 years, which has hurt the working classes of the West so badly, well, precisely because of this deindustrialization, the West does not have the industry to arm its uh, armies, uh, for guilt of the malapropism. And so, therefore, the West cannot simply cannot compete if they were to go in a head-to-head -head war with the Russians, they would run out of ammunition. The West would run out of ammunition in about two months with no possibility of resupply. Uh, the famous uh, saying by Stalin that uh, quantity has a quality all its own. It's very true of the current situation, of the current conflict. <clears throat> and so NATO, the West, is realizing they cannot compete, fight against the Russians, so they won't. And the war is lost. And so it seems increasingly clear that the position of uh, Zelensky in Kiev is becoming untenable. There have already been signs <coughs> excuse me, um, that, that his position is weakening with the West. And so I think what will happen is that the West will begin to slowly withdraw its support in terms of money, in terms of equipment. <coughs> Please excuse me. Um, inflation here is rising, and you can see it in the exchange rate between the hryvnia, which is the Ukrainian currency, and the dollar and the euro. Uh, it's fallen 10% in the last three days. Um, three days ago, you could uh, buy a dollar for uh, 37 and a half to 38 hryvnias, and now it's at 41 and a half. So basically, about uh, almost 10% in three days. Uh, which means, of course, that the Ukraine government, the Zelensky regime, is not getting the foreign currency necessary to keep the government of Ukraine afloat. And so, you know, it, it, these are various signs that are showing that the West is withdrawing its support. And the um, National Security Advisor of the United States, a man named Jacob Sullivan, a man of extraordinary incompetence and stupidity, quite frankly, well, <clears throat> he has stated publicly that Zelensky should be concerned about his personal safety. He is, Jake Sullivan is basically telegraphing the fact that the, um, that the Americans are thinking of physically getting rid of Zelensky. And of course, they're couching it in the language that the Russians are going to do something to Zelensky. 
which has been a common pattern of the Western uh, military political establishment, whereby they will often say that the Russians are planning to do something when it's in fact what they themselves are thinking of doing, and they're projecting it onto the Russians. This is a very common thing that uh, people have noticed over the last year or so, where the Americans, the Europeans are thinking of something and they project it onto the Russians when they themselves are the ones who are planning such a thing. I think that that's why I believe well, uh, and I've said that, so publicly. That, that, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, you did say so publicly. I want to test. Uh, I want to test that. It's worth the audience remembering that Zelensky is a Russian-speaking Ukrainian. He actually yeah. his Ukrainian language is not that good. Uh, his no. native tongue is Russian. Number two, uh, that Zelensky was elected on a peace platform. He was elected <laughs> to make peace with Russia. Uh, and thirdly, of course. I want to test your proposition because, of course, the Americans, as the DM brothers uh, could testify if the Americans hadn't uh, had them rubbed out in Vietnam, you can be uh, useful for America for a time and then you can be killed. Uh, the, uh, the, the Americans could kill Zelensky, the Russians could kill Zelensky, but much more likely is that people within his own regime would kill him, either so that they could fill their pockets in the way that Zelensky has filled his, or because they have some vision that the war can be won differently uh, from that pursued by Zelensky. Explore those three mm -hmm. possibilities, if you would. Sure. Number one, it's never going to be the Russians, because the Russians, as many commentators have pointed out, they need Zelensky to be the one to sign the peace agreement, the ceasefire agreement. Because the Russians see that eventually some ceasefire will have to be signed. And since uh, Zelensky has so much, uh, so many people have validated Zelensky as the legitimate leader of Ukraine, the Russians need to have Zelensky sign that ceasefire agreement. If the Russians wanted to kill Zelensky, and, and I'm not saying anything that people don't know, uh, uh, they could have killed him on the first day of the special military operation. It would have been no trick at all because they know exactly where he is uh, pretty much at all times because of their intelligence, both human intelligence and signal intelligence. For the Russians, it would be no trick to kill Zelensky if they wanted to. The fact that he's alive means that the Russians want him alive. And it's very clear why, because they want him to be the man to sign the peace agreement. So it's not the Russians. Now, insofar as any internal coup any internal coup that takes place to get rid of Zelensky and replace him would have to have the okay of the United States, not the Europeans. The Europeans are the chihuahuas in this story, okay? The big dog are the <laughs> Americans, the people in the Pentagon and Foggy Bottom. The Foggy Bottom is where the State Department is. Well, those people are the ones who are supporting Zelensky. And any coup attempt against Zelensky would have to have the okay of the big dogs back in Washington. And so uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, there is certainly a lot of palace intrigue and there've been a lot of moves as of late of people getting replaced and then not replaced, you know, fired and not fired. I'm talking specifically about the head of the SBU, the, the Ukrainian State Security Services, which uh, the head of it was a childhood friend of Zelensky's and he was fired by Zelensky, but then the next day Zelensky walked it back and said, no, he wasn't fired, he was just suspended. You know, that, that kind of palace intrigue, we will never know the truth. And trying to read the tea leaves and figure out what's going on there, it, it's a fool's errand because it, it, there are too many variables, we don't know what's really going on. All we can see are what the Americans are saying. And that is much more clear. And when the Americans put out a signal that Zelensky should watch himself, that the Russians want to kill him, that's because the Americans are thinking that. See, the Russians have no interest in, in uh, getting rid of Zelensky because it would cause for the Russians many more problems. Whereas the Americans might be thinking along the following lines. They might be thinking, look, Ukraine is lost if we have Zelensky and his military leadership killed in a missile strike that we ourselves do carry out as we've done with other regimes. If we do it, 
and we blame the Russians, and we get the Western press on board with this story, and blame it all on the Russians, and we punt the entire Ukraine nation onto Russia's lap, a, a decapitated nation with no president, no military leadership, and all of a sudden, all of these soldiers, all of them armed, you have chaos, civil chaos, like a situation that happened in Libya. And we punt this whole problem into the lap of the Russians. Well, now that would solve a lot of America's problems very neatly now, wouldn't it? Because it would effectively become a huge problem for the Russians logistically to bring some sort of civil order to the Ukrainian nation. Do recall, Ukraine is the size of France, the size of Texas. It's enormous. It's an enormous piece of country. So to occupy it, to pacify it, you would need at least a quarter of a million soldiers, if not more. And I'm, I'm talking just soldiers just to be policing the place, not, not like a war, just to, to keep social order, okay? And so the Americans, it, would, it seems realistic to me with these comments made by Jake Sullivan, it seems realistic to think that they are uh, entertaining the idea of assassinating Zelensky and his military leadership, blame it on the Russians, cause, deliberately cause, all kinds of civil unrest and anarchy within Ukraine and have this become a permanent problem for Russia. They did something essentially similar in Libya, whereby they um, manufactured the killing of Gaddafi and turned Libya into a complete basket case. I mean, you know, we, we, in the end of it, we literally have slave trading going on in the streets of Tripoli, for crying out loud. And, and all of Libya is just, uh, you know, divided up between various warlords that are constantly fighting one another in complete chaos, right? And we have the Syrian situation where the Americans have done their utmost to create civil unrest uh, and civil chaos, because ultimately the United States is the empire of chaos, where chaos rules because chaos benefits the United States. So that kind of gameplay seems reasonable it, that, that kind of 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 approach which in fact has happened just now in sri lanka where the americans the american ngos non-governmental organizations all these green non-governmental organizations created the conditions where now you have civil chaos in sri lanka and soon you are going to have famines in sri lanka you know a complete catastrophe but this plays into the geostrategic goals of the United States, because instead of trying to raise up the United States, they find it more convenient to pull everybody down. And that seems to me why it's, it's reasonable to think at this time, things can change, of course, but it's reasonable to think that the Americans are the ones planning to get rid of Zelensky, blame it on the Russians, and let Ukraine or even push Ukraine into total civil chaos. Gonzalo Lira, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Stay safe and stay Thank in Thank you touch. so much. And we'll see you again soon, uh, I hope. Should Prime Minister Boris Johnson be on the Tory leadership ballot? Uh, on, uh, on Twitter, yes 56, no 44. On YouTube, yes 35, no 65. On Telegram, Yes, 37, no, 63. So bad news for the Boris partisans, but there's still time for the polling to change. Let's take some of your calls after this break. Tom says after independence, we could choose the government we want. Tom, could you not have called me and argued that nonsense? Couldn't you? What's wrong with you, man? And Ben says, could Scotland actually do better autonomously? Like I want California to secede, but I think we'd thrive if not burdened by the rest of the US. How very revealing of you, Ben. How utterly revealing of you. And Philip says, how any Labour or Tory supporter has the nerve to say the SNP are corrupt is beyond me. Why do you people not have the guts to call up instead of cowering 
behind one single name on social media. Should the Prime Minister Boris Johnson be on the Tory leadership ballot, you can vote until, I think, 8.25. 3,300 people have voted already. And on the Super Chat donations, Eric Suarez has donated five US dollars. Thank you, Eric. He says, Viva AMLO, Viva Mr. Galloway, and Viva Moats. Viva Eric Suarez, too. Carol Hope donates five British pounds. Very grateful to you, Carl, and hope is a very valuable word at this point in time. Arlen Everest gives 10 US dollars, thank you very much. Baby Gerald donated US dollars 20. I hope Baby Gerald had his parents' permission. Keep it up, George, he says. Otto Calvo donates Norwegian crowns 50, thank you very much. Sounds very handsome. I've no idea what the Norwegian crown is valued at, but whatever it is, I'm grateful to you. Lance Maleski donated 20 British pounds. Thank you, Lance, very much indeed. And William Cole donated 50 Swedish crowns. Ditto, William, but thanks anyway. Uh, suffering, I don't know if I can say that name, but... Mr. or Mrs. Suffering donated 10 US dollars, says, good to see you, George. Keep it up. I always watch. Thank you. Spencer Richards donates five pounds and says, spare a dollar. Nobody loves you when you're down and out, Spencer, except you and the rest of the audience that are donating. Now, Stu Janine says, uh, donates two pounds and says, great show, as always, GG. Let's take a first call. It's from Michael in Washington, D.C. or uh, Washington C.D., County Durham. I don't know. Michael, where are you? State. The state. Northwest. Okay, welcome. Welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Galloway. Thank you for your courage. Um, oh I was wondering what I'm going to propose a scenario what actually happened with uh, Zelensky being Jewish, getting elected and having all the uh, Azov uh, Enzies there, and that he had confronted them um, early on to pull troops away from the Donbass, um, and they said, no, you do that, we'll put 10,000 more in. There was a video out there. Now, I'm, he, yeah. somebody knows history. When you send uh, German soldiers to the Eastern Front, you know, bad things happened. So Zelensky not being able to, say, illegalize the uh, party, did he send the Azov Enzies over to the Eastern Front, front with the intention of being killed to so-called enforce the Minsky Agreement in a different way? And if so, if the people realize that, what's going to happen? And in addition, there's one more thing. I don't think, he did I, I don't, uh, yeah, go on. Go on. He did uh, go to uh, Israel and propose some kind of arrangement with the uh, country to place soldiers on every street corner, if he had to. Would they be IDF soldiers, and would he be turning over the country to Israel for a farming community because Africa might not be working out too well for them? No, so. uh, I don't agree with either of those uh, propositions, but thanks for making them. Israel has a very ambivalent attitude to this conflict. Uh, they have uh, a kind of special relationship with Russia, uh, and they don't want entirely to burn it. They know that Russia could cause them serious trouble uh, on the Syrian front, uh, that Russia could throw its weight behind the Palestinian cause, far more strenuously than they have done to date. There are millions of Russians in Israel. There are millions of Israelis in Russia. They have a visa-free arrangement. You go to the airport in Moscow. Uh, people just walk straight through uh, from uh, one country to the other. They don't want to prejudice all of that. Uh, the fact that uh, Zelensky is Jewish 
I will not make uh, that much of uh, a, a problem. Some of the great leaders of the African National Congress, uh, the now ruling party in South Africa, were very prominently Jewish, uh, but that didn't stop Israel from supporting the apartheid uh, regime. So uh, I don't think that uh, Zelensky being Jewish has much to do with it. It was in the beginning a useful fig leaf. Look, we've got a Jewish uh, prime minister, president rather. How can we be uh, Nazis? But of course, the world then saw the Nazis in all their ugliness in the Azov Battalion, but also many other regiments, the right sector and so on. There's a plethora of Nazi outfits in Russia. I saw a, an amazing photograph today from the brief period in which uh, uh, the Bandera uh, leadership was in power in Western Ukraine at least and the slogans were clear long live Hitler, long live Bandera, long live the independent Ukrainian state. The history of Nazism, fascism in Western Ukraine is so well attested that anyone with half a brain can easily locate it. And in case you were in any doubt, you could look at their tattoos, their swastikas, their death's heads, their SS insignia. And even on the lids of their coffin, Reuters put out, I think it was Reuters, might have been Associated Press, put out a dewy-eyed picture of uh, a, a coffin about to be incinerated in the crematorium and somehow missed the SS insignia on the lid of the coffin. If they didn't miss it, they didn't draw attention to it in the caption of the picture. So no, the Azov were on uh, the border with the Donbass, on the border with the self-declared People's Republics, because they wanted to be, because they wanted to kill Russians. And those were the Russian-speaking people that they could legitimately kill acting on behalf of the regime in Kiev. No, I don't believe that Israel is in any position to occupy Ukraine. Uh, they're going to have as many difficulties as they have ever had in occupying Nablus in the next few days. Um, now, phone numbers I've given you, 08 that's the number if you're in the UK or Ireland. And if you're in the US, plus one, eight four four nine four four double three double four. Now, Chris Williamson, the former Labour MP, a former friend and colleague and indefatigable campaigner for the then Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, was shamefully and shamelessly rooted out of the Labour Party, smeared and slandered on the ludicrous proposition that he, a lifelong campaigner against all racism, all fascism, including, of course, anti-Semitism, was himself an anti-Semite. He's just published a book. It's called Ten Years Hard Labour. As I said, Chris, I wish I'd only done ten years. Chris Williamson joins me now. Thanks, Good evening, uh, George. Chris. Was it, a hard, was it a hard book to write? Uh, well, it was cathartic, to be honest with you, because I uh, was able to, you know, revisit the that, that period and indeed, you know, join the research for it. I mean, a lot of it, obviously, I could remember, but I, I wanted to research, research and make sure I got my facts straight. And yeah, I was quite surprised, frankly, at, at the length to which the opponents, the Zionist lobby, the right wing, the kind of neoliberals, the establishment went to, to destroy me. And, and what was particularly galling, I think, was former comrades or people who I assumed were comrades who who just looked the other way, who kept their heads down. Um, there were very few like you, George, who, you know, people with a platform who actually stood up and stood strong and, and actually had my back. 
the support from grassroots members, however, was, was overwhelming. It was it was wonderful. I mean, that's what kept me going, to be honest with you. But the story really is, is, is it's, it's a kind of modern day Greek tragedy, really. We had a, a great opportunity, in my opinion, to, you know, transform the country to, you know, make a real difference in, in terms of pushing and advancing the cause of anti uh, imperialism and, and socialism at home. Uh, but unfortunately, we blew it. I mean, and I think the left of the Labour Party actually are the architects of the, their own demise in many ways. Their, their failure to to defend their reputation, their failure to to stand up to bad faith actors led us to the state that we're in today. But but this 10 years, I mean, the book, it, I mean, the, the name, you know, 10 years old Labour, it refers to the kind of 10 years that I was in and out of Parliament, as it were. Um, so I talk about the the Miliband era and and some of the you know the battles that we had in the parliamentary Labour Party, um, the the despair that I felt when I lost my seat and the hope that was then generated by Jeremy getting onto the the ballot paper, um, the civil war that that then ensued between the parliamentary Labour Party, the establishment of the Labour Party and, and and its members. It was a civil war that I told Newsnight that the membership were determined to win and. Uh, naively hoped and thought that we were capable of winning it at that point in time, but quite clearly we weren't. Um, and then to actually win back my seat, and and then to embark upon the you know the democracy roadshow, to you know bring about those crucial democratic reforms inside the Labour Party. And as I pointed out at all the meetings that I attended all over the country, well attended meetings, that this wasn't just a naval contemplating exercise, this kind of democracy agenda that we. We're embarking upon this. This was crucial to actually bringing about a situation where, if we could get a Labour government elected, that we would then have the mechanism to ensure that that government implemented the programme and ensured that it defended that Labour government. Because, I mean, as you'll recall, George, I mean, there was a serving army general talking about using fair means or foul to actually, uh, you know, undermine, to prevent a, and indeed to oust the. A Corbyn-led Labour government that had the temerity to scrap Trident and cut defence spending and withdraw from NATO. So you know we were up against you know huge odds, um, and we might not have prevailed. You know, but we never even really tried. That was the problem. The the, the leader's office were constantly in a state of retreat, constantly surrendering, never never really prepared. To stand up and and defend themselves, and to you know defend Jeremy, and, you know for Jeremy to defend himself, and telling him to go along, for example, to prostrate himself before the Zionist board of deputies and Jewish leadership council, which were incredibly hostile to the Labour Party, to a pro-Palestinian stance, and you know I could have written the, as I'm sure you could have, the the press statement that they were going to release after they'd met with Jeremy on on, on that occasion. So. Yeah, it was a catalogue of errors, and, and and what I've tried to do in, in in this book, George, is to kind of set all that out from my perspective, uh, and to give an inside story, really, on some of the you know the intrigue that that went on. But also, uh, you know, I've tried to strike an optimistic note at the end that you know it's not over. The battle, okay, we've lost a you know significant battle. The, the left is very is weakened as a consequence of it, but. The, the people that were inspired by that policy agenda, you know, haven't disappeared into the ether. It was a policy agenda that was very, very popular. And, um, you know, what I've been trying to, to do is to encourage people on the left, you know, socialists to to collaborate, to work together. And that's the sort of message that I, that I finished the, the book with, that, you know, if we, if we recognise that and actually implement that, labor movement maxim that unity is strength then you know everything is still to play for i mean you know we, we have shot ourselves in the foot on the left and, and you know we're much further back than we were but we can't give up we mustn't give up we have to continue the fight on that subject uh, i'll put my own cards on the table i'm not so much sad as angry at uh, at what has happened uh, because I agree with you that it is overwhelmingly a self-inflicted wound, not so much a flesh wound, more a, you know, a, a decapitation, certainly a cutting off of our own uh, limbs. Uh, 
uh, are you sad or, or angry? And is the book infused with sadness or anger? A bit of both, to be honest with you, George. Um, and certainly I was always uh, uh, writing it. I, I went through all of those emotions. I was kind of reliving, in a sense, the, uh, you know, the trauma, really. And it was a trauma to be uh, initially suspended from the Labour Party, you know, because I thought it was got to be a mistake. I'd give them a life to the Labour Party, George. I mean, I joined the Labour Party as a 19-year-old uh, apprentice bricklayer back in 19... 76. I've been a dedicated activist week in and week out. Um, and, and I talk about it in, in the book, actually, on, on the day that I was, um, you know, removed from the party about the early days when I first joined the Labour Party, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed and full of hope. And as you'll recall, George, when you joined the Labour Party, or maybe like any organisation, if you kind of show any enthusiasm, you're given lots of jobs to do. And one of, one of the jobs that I was given was to be the tote collector. And you may recall lots of constituency Labour parties back in the 1970s used to run a tote as a, as a fundraising exercise. And I used to go around the village where I used to live. And you know, when I, there was a little council estate at the edge of the village um, called West End Drive. And whenever I used to turn up on a Sunday morning to collect the, the tote money and the kids would be out playing, they used to shout, the Labour man, Dad, the Labour man's here. And I, I was just, that memory came flooding back to me and I thought, Bloody hell, you know, the Labour the Labour man is no more. And and it really was quite an upsetting time, uh, a traumatic time. And as I say, I only really got through it, thanks to the solidarity of people like yourself, George. Grassroots members, they were incredibly supportive, incredibly kind. Uh, you know, it wasn't just love. Sorry, it wasn't just solidarity, George. It, it, was, it was genuine love that was being uh, expressed to me. And I, I really am so sure. incredibly and eternally grateful for that. But, but as I was researching, as well as that, re, you know, reliving that sadness, I also was incredibly angry. Yes, George. I mean, and some of the things, for example, the former chief executive, and I'm going to talk about this in some detail, the former chief executive of the, uh, the Board of Deputies used to be a friend of mine. Actually, I've known her for 40 years. We used to work together. We were welfare rights officers together. We were members of the Labour Party together. We were trade union activists together. She went on and became a full-time official for the former National Union of public employees. She was a good friend of my late wife. They went on holiday together. They went to Cuba together. And on the day or the day after that I was temporarily reinstated in June of 2019, she wrote an incredibly, you know, vicious uh, op-ed for the, I think it was the Independent, absolutely, you know, monstering me and, and making all sorts of allegations about me, which she knew were barefaced lies. That's things like that really did kind of hurt. And I put a note in the book about, you know, if, if my late wife Lonnie was alive, you know, she, she would have some choice words for Jilly Merrin and, you know, the way in which she, she wrote that, that tissue of, of lies. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's things like, as we were saying, I think at the at the, the beginning, really, the, the the failure of the the socialist campaign group, so-called socialist campaign group, to show any solidarity. I mean, you know, some of these people, are, they should know everything, all that there is to know about solidarity. I mean, one of them had, had been through the miners' strike, um, and they were just they just weren't prepared to to do that. And, and what what it brought home to me, George, is is that. These parliamentarians, they, they're just self-serving. They're more interested in protecting sure. their career than actually doing the right thing. And my position, maybe I'm naive, I don't know, maybe I'm stupid, I don't know. But I always took the view that when you have a political platform, and this is something you did and paid the price for it, George, you should use it to fight for what you believe in, to fight for what's right, to fight for you know, the values that brought you into the Labour Party, You know, to stand up for the people that elected you, but so many, well, all of them, I say so many of them, all of them, all of them didn't live up to that. And I've often said, and I think there's a, there's a chapter in the book uh, about uh, cowards and traitors, and you know the line in the red flag, George, it's uh, though cowards flinch and traitors sneer will keep the red flag flying here. Well, I tell you what, that could have been written for the Parliamentary Labour Party. It is entirely made up of cowards and traitors with no exceptions. Now, that grieves me. Because as a working class kid joining the Labour Party and, I don't know, maybe still have that 
perhaps working class chip on the shoulder, maybe, I don't know. But when I, you know, got to Parliament and stuff, I was in awe of a lot of these people, George. I didn't feel I, you know, I didn't think I would have become an MP. I didn't think I was, I was, I was worthy of being, you know, of sharing the, the green benches with them. I thought these were, you know, political titans. And they end up being, you know, it turns out they're all political bloody pygmies. <laughs> Excuse my French, but they are. And I thought, well, good, this comes there's to a lot of when... flinching. There's a lot of uh, flinching yeah. and sneering. Uh, I just make You're this last point to you. The very same people who we watched destroying your political life are now attacking... Keir Starmer and yes. some of their acolytes in the Labour Party are finally turning on. You mentioned the Board of Deputies. Uh, yes. It was not just anti-Corbyn, not just anti-Chris Williamson. It was anti-Labour. It yeah. was a Conservative Party front. And thus yeah. they are now in full-scale attack on Keir Starmer, who destroyed Corbyn, Williamson, and the others. It's, yes. uh, it's karma, really, isn't it? Well, it is a bit of karma there, George. And, and, and you know, the, the, the breathtaking hypocrisy is, you know, it seems quite something. I mean, you know, one of the key protagonists of this whole sorry saga of the bogus anti-Semitism uh, a campaign, you know, the kind of anti-Semitism crisis which had which had kind of engulfed the Labour Party, which never really had in reality, was of course Margaret Hodge, who I think submitted something like 200 complaints about anti-Semitism. It turns out 190 of them weren't even Labour Party members, and I don't know what happened to the other 10. I suspect they were they were thrown out as as well, even though the the sort of uh, you know presumption was to uh, uh, believe these absurd. Uh, accusations that were being thrown out against people who were lifelong anti-racists. Uh, uh, um, but she came to Keir Starmer's defence when one of the, the one of the organisations that had uh, made the complaint again, the bogus complaint to the uh, Equalities and Human uh, uh, Rights uh, Commission, which led to the investigation into the Labour Party. Um, and, and, and she saying, you know, attacking the, the, the camp, so-called campaign against anti-Semitism. And, and she was a patron of the organization, but she stood up and said, I'm sick of these people, you know, using anti-Semitism as a, as a, as a stick to attack the Labour Party. Well, this is precisely what, uh, what Jeremy should have been saying. Well, I was trying to say that, you know, but others, the campaign group, Jeremy and the rest of them, if only they'd done that. Now, look, George, we might still not have won. There were massive odds. You know, massive forces ranged against us, as, as I've kind of alluded to. Um, huge forces ranged against. We might not have, have got there, but you know, we just we just made it easy. You know, and we went out with a whimper. Well, I I like to say, guy didn't go out with a whimper. You know, I was inspired with people like Jackie Walker, who was was expelled, a black Jewish woman whose ironically parents had to uh, flee or were actually you know kicked out of the United States of America in the uh, McCarthyite uh, witch hunt. Um, uh, how ironic that, you know, she was then herself a victim of a McCarthy-style witch hunt inside the Labour Party. But the thing that I was attacked for was for defending people like uh, Jackie Walker. But, you know, how ironic that, um, you know, things like that uh, can happen. And as I say, George, if only, if only, you know, Jeremy and uh, John McDonnell and, uh, you know, key figures in the uh, socialist campaign group had taken a leaf out of Margaret Hodges' book, you know, two or three years hence, where she is calling out, she's calling out the campaign against anti-Semitism. Uh, I mean, you know, as I say, I called them out, called them out over the, the bogus complaints that they were making to the EHRC. And you know that report, as you will, I'm sure, recall, George, which concluded that you know Labour did have a problem with with anti-Semitism, alluded to the assertion that you know the Labour Party was guilty of uh, you know harassing the the Jewish community, kind of institutionally anti-Semitic. They were only able to cite two cases. That was a sum total of it. I mean, I was initially, initially in their in their crosshairs and took legal action to force them to remove my name from the final report. They wanted to accuse me of being in breach of the Equalities Act. They wanted to, uh, I'm going to cover this in, in, in the book, um, and say that uh, I was guilty of, of harassing the Jewish community. It's absolute 
it's an absolute scandal. It's, it's an appalling calumny that they were uh, uh, indulging it against me. But you know, we prevailed. We used legal, uh, you know, the legal mechanisms to 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 force a hand. But that cost us. I mean, thanks to the generosity again of supporters. But it cost us in order to you know protect my reputation as best I could from that latest uh, uh, attack, which you know was a couple of years ago with the. EHRC cost over twenty-five thousand pounds, George. I mean, it's just not right that this sort of uh, no, you, you know, you can be ultimately traduced, and in order to protect your, you know, reputation, and you can't get that money back. That's the thing. I mean, you know, as I say, thankfully, I'm not a rich man. You know, thankfully, supporters came to the rescue. But there are so many other people for every kind of you know sort of high-profile individual like myself, Ken Livingston, Jackie Walker, people like that. There are hundreds, probably thousands of people who were targeted and uh, abused and expelled from the Labour Party and on these, on these false accusations. And many of those people suffered, uh, you know, acute mental health problems as a consequence of it. Some of them didn't have the benefit. In some ways, George, it was a bit, I mean, OK, I was in the public eye. And so maybe there's more attention, but there was a lot of support. Yes, there was a lot of hatred directed at me, but there was a lot of support from from you know from grassroots supporters, obviously people like yourself, but just think about all those hundreds and possibly thousands of people who had to suffer in silence, you know, in in isolation. It must have been you know, and, he, and of course, and it's still happening. And, and because George, because Jeremy didn't stand up, because the socialist campaign group didn't stand up, this anti-Semitism smear this, this this bogus anti-semitism uh, attack because the you know the zionist lobby apply a maximalist strategy has expanded and indeed they even set it out they, i mean they've got they went public and one of their key the key figures in, in in these bogus attacks set out that the next target would be in, in academia so people like professor david miller you know an esteemed academic he's been drummed out of his job he's lost his career even though he was cleared on two separate occasions, the second time by a, a QC, no less, who said that he'd done nothing wrong, he'd said nothing remotely anti-Semitic, but he was still fired because the University of Bristol said he didn't meet the standards required by the university, whatever that means. And I, I know that they were put under pressure by, by key figures in the Zionist lobby, some of whom were funders of the university. And you know, they've really let a genie out of the bottle here. Uh, and, you know, it could be yeah, difficult yeah, to, yeah. to put it back in. But well, we look, have I'll, to stand I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, Chris. There'll be a lot of books written about the period that you have just been describing. Yours will be one of the most important of, though. I hope it sells very well. Tell me, finally, how can people buy it? Well, it's available on Lola Books. Uh, it's also available on Amazon if you uh, search uh, 10 Years Hard Labor. If you want a link on how to um, you know, order the book, you can find that on my Twitter profile and my Facebook profile. It's the, it's the tweet which is pinned to the top of my page. Uh, but just one final thing I will say, George, um, when you uh, seek to buy it, um, from directly from the publisher. It's a German publisher. The reason I've got a German publisher, George, is that not a single British publisher would touch it, including the left-wing publishers. And I, and I tried them all, I assure you. Nobody would touch this. Um, so that's why I you know, encourage people to persevere. It's a little bit awkward when you go onto the Lola Books um, site. Well, I say, oh, it's not that awkward, really, but you've just got to, you've just got to click the uh, the Union Jack to get to, to get the kind of English language to, to come up. And if you just, it's a little bit clunky, but, you know, you can find your way through it. Or the alternative, the other alternative is to is to just search it on, on Amazon. But the links to where you can purchase it, George, are on my Twitter and Facebook profiles. OK, OK. You should have come to me. I would have published it. Chris Williamson, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Let's go quickly to the lines here from Julian in London. Julian. Go ahead, sir. Hello, George. So my, I just wanted to honour the memory of your friend and mine, Eric Levy, who passed away last week, age 94. God rest his soul. He was one of the most tireless and, of course, at 94, mm -hmm. one of the most long-standing activists in all good causes. 
in all the time I've been in politics. He's been in my audience, as it were, uh, since the 1970s, certainly the 1980s. I grew so used to seeing him in my audience, shaking hands, embracing him as I came down from the stage, and then his most recent campaign, the one in defense of the political prisoner, Julian Assange, uh, took him right up to his grave. He was arrested by the police outside the court uh, in Westminster Magistrates Court, arrested in his 90s. Uh, such was his devotion uh, to the cause of the political prisoner Julian Assange. As a religious believer myself, I ask God to have mercy on his soul and that he should rest in peace. Julian, thanks for bringing that up uh, and giving me the chance to pay tribute to the wonderful, indefatigable Eric Levy, who died just the other day. Should Prime Minister Boris Johnson be on the Tory leadership ballot? I think the 10 minutes to go. And uh, it's not great news for Boris. On Twitter, he does win 55 to 45. But on YouTube and on Telegram, I'm afraid he gets absolutely tanked. A quick break, then more of your calls. There is no trick other than hard work, creativity, care, and recognizing that duty is more important than love. The booming voice of Robert Maxwell, an arrogant man who used his publishing empire to gain him power and influence. But in this shocking account, never told before in this way, George Galloway recalls his first encounter with Maxwell. It looked like a, a grizzly bear uh, advancing towards me and punches me with these giant fists like sides of ham right in the solar plexus so hard that I literally bent double. Then after George exposed Maxwell as a crook in Parliament it was war. Every one of his papers the Daily Mirror then following the Sunday Mirror the Sunday People the Daily Record, then a few days later, the Sunday Mail in Scotland. Even the European, which he then owned. All over Galloway. Scottish Daily News journalist Ron Mackay was there. Every night, presumably when he had a drink in him, he would boom over the tannoy about the, 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 the cretins, the fools. The majority of the workforce believed that he would take it over and their jobs would be secure. But of course he didn't. He just disappeared. And then... The millionaire newspaper publisher Robert Maxwell is dead. What really happened? Did Robert Maxwell jump or was he pushed? It could be that he went out to, as he did, miturate over the side of the boat. I'm with Ghislaine Maxwell in that I lean towards the murder. This is Maxwell, the monster. You said, what is my secret? I will let you and your viewers know what it is. I'm not attached to property. Consequently, losing or gaining it means nothing to me. You can watch that on my Patreon page. Uh, it's been remarkably successful, that little Maxwell vignette, a kind of mini documentary. Uh, that's uh, Robert Maxwell, the father of the uh, now convicted and uh, now a convict, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. Let's uh, go straight to the caller, shall we? Uh, David in California on the Ukraine. Go ahead, David. How you doing? Oh, I got... All good, uh, thank you. What something. would you like to say? Yeah, I heard something on YouTube the other day about uh, in Donetsk. The uh, uh, Ukrainian army was using white phosphorus on a civilian population in Donetsk. 
I haven't heard anything yes, about yesterday. it from anywhere they, else. They did it. But the, but the place I got. Well, you have that. You have that. Uh, you have that. You have that from me. Uh, it happened yesterday. Uh, the film of it is freely available. Thousands and tens of thousands of people have seen it on social media. Not one television channel has broadcast it. Not one mainstream newspaper has reported it. It is a straight war crime to use white phosphorus against the civilian population. I myself have seen it in Lebanon when Israel used it on the camps and on the civilians in Beirut. Do you know what it does? You ingest it, it cooks you from the inside. Smoke begins to come out of your mouth and nose and pores. You are destroyed by the ingestion of a chemical weapon. And Ukraine used it last night on the civilian population of Donetsk. And no single Western politician or journalist or broadcaster gives a monkey's toss about it. Put that on your plate and eat it. Faisa is in London. Go ahead, Faisa. Uh, good evening, George. Um, I just wanted to uh, note something about uh, what you said earlier about uh, Jeremy Corbyn not being there for you whilst you got expelled from the Labour Party. And also comment uh, in parallel with uh, you know, uh, Chris Williamson's uh, experience uh, uh, during that time. Now, uh, <laughs> you have to understand, or, or you, should, you, should, you, you, you do understand, I'm sure, but you're either damned or you don't if you do something. And, and Jeremy Corbyn chose uh, to you know, respond diplomatically. And that's what he did. And uh, I, I, I don't see any reason for you and Chris to be sour with Jeremy Corbyn's conduct, <laughs> or um, to be honest <laughs> with you, because it's unfair. Yeah. It's unfair. Well, I, I come mean, from it, the school that says, well, okay, let, let me answer and then I'll let you back in. I come from the school that says, if you don't run, they can't chase you. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn ran and it didn't work. So if he did choose that path of least resistance, it led to disaster. Do you agree? Well, uh, let me put this to you. Um, uh, what happened with uh, Boris Johnson is that he was backing every single one of them, which, he, which you're assuming that he should have done for you. He backed every single one of his, his ministers when they were talking about all sorts of slander and um, they even caught him on tape. Even more evidence against the, their scandals uh, of, of the, you know, his members. And they still snaked him. They still stabbed him in the back. So that's why I say to you, mm. you're either damned or well, if you uh, do, or John, you're damned if you don't. Yeah, because yeah. Well, maybe, well, maybe if you're right, that you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, maybe you'd be better doing the right thing. You'll be damned, but you'll be damned if you don't, by your argument. So never mind me, forget about me. I don't give a toss about Jeremy Corbyn. But Chris Williamson has every reason to be wounded by the fact that as the most prominent supporter of Jeremy Corbyn in the entire Labour Party in Parliament, that when they came to destroy Chris Williamson, Jeremy Corbyn did nothing about it, only later himself to be destroyed by the very same people. So if you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, perhaps you should do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. Last word to you, Faisa. No, no, I, I agree with you. It's just, it, it's just um, I think Thank you shouldn't you. be you too agree sour. With me. I'm, glad, I'm, glad, uh, <laughs> I'm glad to hear you agree with me. Super chat next. Uh, Tomas donated five euros. I appreciate that. Says actually thought Zelensky was gone on holiday considering his absence lately. Thanks for bringing us up to date. Jiggermas donates five English pounds. Says George like Bobby Zimmerman 
Just keep on keeping on. We need you there, my friend. I'll keep on keeping on, but to quote Bobby Zimmerman, things have changed. Greta Panzini donated GTQ 140. That is Guatemalan Quetzal. Greta, you have donated the very first Guatemalan Quetzal that we have ever received. And so however much or little it is worth, I will never forget it. God bless you. Robert McCormick donates 10 US dollars. Thank you, Robert. Jeremiah Alphonsus donates $9.99 and says, militant mediocrities are in power. These mad globalists will not stop until they are stopped. Thank you very much indeed. Let's take a call from Eve in Idaho. Go ahead, Eve. Hello, uh, George. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to, um, to, to say something about Ukraine. Um, I believe that at the, um, there are three very important parameters for this war. The first parameter is the length of the front. How long is the front? The second parameter is the depth of the front. That means how, how, where is the guy who is shooting at you, how far he is. And the third parameter is how much weapon is coming in. At the beginning of the war, the front was quite small. The depth was quite small. And the weapon were, you know, little weapon. Now, uh, the the length of the front is very extended because of the business with Kherson that, uh, you know, the Ukrainians are preparing a war. The depth of the front can go to 300 miles if we are delivering those long weapons because that's how far uh, the shooter can be in front of you. So basically, you have to, um, to survey, you have to look after an area which may be 500 kilometers times 300 kilometers. And the amount of weapon coming in is probably 10 times bigger than it was at the beginning. So I think that the president of Russia has in front of him a choice, go after Kiev or try to fight this gigantic battlefield plus a gigantic amount of weapon coming and he's going, yeah, he's going to have some people who tell you, look, to take Kiev and to go to west of Ukraine to, to try to block it is, is easier than having this gigantic front. And what I wanted to tell you is that I believe that they are taking a kind of a pause because they are doing general mobilization and they're going to finish, finish off Ukraine by taking Kiev. That's what I wanted to uh, I, I suspect so also, uh, Eve, I've said so before, I expected this war to end with the partition of Ukraine between East and West along the river Dnieper, uh, but I think it's gone uh, far too far uh, now for that. After all that they have done and all that they have spent in blood and treasure, in international affairs and so on, I don't believe that Russia will allow uh, a NATO base camp in Western Ukraine uh, to survive this war. I really don't. Uh, let's hear from Peter in Warrington, who thinks the Pope is a hologram. I'm all ears and eyes, Peter. The, 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 the vision of that just came into my mind. Go on. Uh, I'm, I'm on the BBC website reading a story, Pope Francis, the Pontiff's pilgrimage of penance to Canada and um, I simply don't believe the story and I don't believe it because um, I think the Pope has been prosecuted for crimes that he did in Buenos Aires in the 1980s the, the, the rock band um, yeah, go ahead Peter yeah, go the on. rock band U2 wrote a, um, a song about it called Mothers of the Disappeared. So I think that the Pope is a prosecuted criminal. And um, I don't believe that he's, in, he's going to be in Canada. 
And I think um, if you do your homework on it, you'll discover that there's a Canadian chap called Kevin Annette who has, who assembled in, I think, 2012, a common law court, and he um, prosecuted the um, Queen Elizabeth. So uh, that information is out there, but you guys aren't reporting on it. Uh, no, uh, Peter. Um, that's Peter from Ward 5. Uh, who gets out on Sundays and habitually calls us with these cockamamie calls. Uh, now, don't forget the special offer on my two novels, uh, the Queensway series. First one's called Queensway, second one called Black Lake. Uh, the third one, uh, which will be out quite soon, uh, is uh, more or less being proofread at the moment. And the fourth one, called Killarney Bluff uh, will follow it. So it'll be a five-parter. Uh, that's how busy I am on my uh, holidays. I'm writing uh, the sequel to Black Lake. But you can get the two of them for £8.99, including postage. Uh, uh, no, plus postage, I beg your pardon. £8.99 plus postage. You can get them from Amazon, but if you want them signed and, uh, and dedicated from me, you'll need to get them from my shop and the details are there now. Clear the lines! The show can't end without a call from the legend that is Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma, what are you going to upbraid me about now? <laughs> Hello, George. I'm just interested to know why do you believe Greta Thunberg is a bit of a nuisance? And I just wanted you to explain What's your problem with her? Because I didn't really understand that earlier. She's a young girl who's passionate no. about climate change, and I didn't know. I would like to know why. You know, you think. Well, more be... more fool. No, you're right. You you you're onto something. More fool us for allowing a young girl passionate about climate change to dictate uh, the environmental, energy, and farming policies. Uh, of developed countries like our own, like the Netherlands and so on. Uh, the fault lies with us. Uh, I happen to think she's a bit of a step for daughter. Uh, I happen to think that she has been, uh, she has been misused uh, by the lobby that has made her the, their champion. Uh, I think that she would have been better having uh, a better time of it at her tender age than to be pressed into uh, the mold of a fanatical zealot who believes that the uh, planet is doomed and that humanity is for the off uh, and who seems at times absolutely consumed uh, with the terror and fear which she wishes to impart to the rest of us. I don't like people scaring my children with apocalyptic uh, visions of the end of the world because I believe that such visions are hopelessly exaggerated. I'm old enough, as are you, to remember when it was a new ice age that we were supposed to be fearing. I've got magazine covers uh, with the earth iced over uh, from the 1990s. Uh, that if we didn't do this, that, and the next thing, uh, the planet was going to freeze over. Now I'm asked to believe by people like Greta uh, that it is going to burn up. I look at weather maps on the wall in television studios where Europe is painted in the most bright, livid red. But when you read the temperature that has made it bright, livid red, it's the same temperature as 30 years ago when it was presented as extremely normal weather for summer in Europe, in Spain, in Iberia. So I'm against catastrophism and I believe that Greta has been used by the catastrophists to stampede people on a course against farming against farmers, against all kinds of energy consumption, against nuclear power, against clean coal technology, against uh, gas, 
uh, for uh, heating and fuel uh, purposes. And basically, they have a kind of attitude of taking us back to a presumed Elysian pre-industrial life, which was not an Elysian field at all. Life in the pre-industrial age was nasty, brutal, and short for the great mass of the people. I believe we need to grow our economy because we need to ensure that the 8 billion people on the planet have a chance of living at least as good a life as you and I have lived, Norma. That have the chance to develop their country, develop their economy, and bring their children up in dignity and plenty. I believe in growth. I believe in industry, I believe in production, I believe in manufacture, I believe in the white hot heat of technology. The only difference between me and some others is that I want the fruits of that industry to be distributed fairly amongst all the people and all the countries of the world. I've gone over my allotted time. I'd like to thank you all for being there and for joining me every Sunday at 7 o'clock for the Mother of All Talk Shows. I want you to join me for the Galloway Show on Wednesday at 10 p.m. UK time until the 12th of October when you'll have two Mother of All Talk Shows every single week to enjoy. I've been George Galloway. You've been a marvelous audience.